I remember that day as if it was yesterday. I was nine years old. I was standing outside on a bright, sunny, beautiful summer day. I was at one of America's top, greatest amusement parks. And yet I was anything but amused. You see, over the past year, I had grown. And I found myself, frighteningly, meeting the requirements of this sign, which wouldn't have been that bad except for the fact that it was in front of this sign, the demon. At the time, it was billed as the continent's scariest, craziest, most death-defying roller coaster. I was absolutely petrified. And with a good amount of peer pressure and, frankly, a lot of parental influence and persuasion, I found myself sliding into the roller coaster car, feeling the bar coming down around me and buckling in for what would become the ride of my life. As the train lurched out of the station, it began a slow, steady climb to certain death. Click, click, click. Thoughts immediately began to flood my mind, and frankly, they were all thoughts of doubt and fear, right? What am I doing? Why did I make this decision? How is it that I find myself on this roller coaster? What if something goes wrong? What if I fall out? What if I die? I'm only nine years old, and I've never kissed a girl. Good God, this would be a horrible way to go. We rocketed over the edge and began a death-defying plunge down and down, faster and faster. My stomach, which had been here, rocketed up to my throat. And as quickly as it rocketed up, it went back down as we did loop after loop after loop. We moved into a corkscrew, and we were going at a velocity that water started to come out of my eyes off the side. And to this day, I refuse to admit whether that was water because of the speed of the roller coaster or whether those were tears of fear. And while I don't have a photograph of myself on the roller coaster that fateful day, this is a pretty close approximation <laughs> as to what was going on. So I have a personal question for all of you. How many of you enjoy a death-defying, frightening roller coaster by a show of hands? OK, in a group of entrepreneurs, to a degree, it's not surprising. But still, with risk takers in the room, it's only about 30 or 40 percent, right? We don't like the uncertainty and the fear that is created from a roller coaster. And yet, with all these business owners, the fact of the matter is you are subjecting your customers to this type of an interaction every time they decide to do business with you. They have no idea what they're getting into. Frankly, you're asking them to climb into a seat, hang on for a ride that many of them, it's against their will, it's painstaking, and frankly, you're not even offering to help them buckle in. At the end of the day, when someone decides to do business with you, a clock starts ticking. It starts ticking from the moment they make the decision to sign that contract or to hire you for your services. And as that clock ticks, some wonderful things happen in the human mind, right? It starts out with this place of love, and we're really excited about our choice. We're hopeful that this is the person, this is the solution, the product or the service that's going to answer our dreams. And yet, almost as quickly as we make that decision, our mind starts to play games with us. I mean, it's psychological warfare. right? We begin to doubt everything we've ever believed. You know, In common parlance, they call it buyer's remorse. Did I make the right decision? Did I evaluate enough options? Am I paying too much? Am I paying more than my friends? Did I get persuaded too much by that sales guy? I really liked him, but man, is this really the right choice? And these games start to go on and on in our mind. The effect on your business is absolutely devastating. Pretend you were in banking, OK? In banking, 32% of new customers will leave within the first year. 32%. Half of those leave within the first day, or in the first 100 days, rather. Have you opened a bank account recently? I mean, frankly, it's a pain in the ass. You have to fill out all these forms. You have to jump through all these hoops. And yet 32% of your customers are going to leave within the first year. Let's say you owned a restaurant, like Chuck E. Cheese, right? They do studies on people that go to restaurants like this. And if we were to take this entire room, about 100 people, and go into Chuck E. Cheese, 46% of you would never go to that restaurant again. 46%. Now, I mean, on one hand, they chose a rat as their logo and they serve food, so I understand it. But on the other hand, is that even sustainable? 46%? Well, some of you are in the software business, all right? And you offer software as a service from the cloud. 
right? Well, I hate to rain on your parade, but those of you that have subscription models, 20% of your customers are gonna leave within the first 100 days, 20%. Now, you may be sitting there and saying, well, Joey, this is real simple. I don't work in banking, I don't own a restaurant, and I don't do software. And if we had more than 15 minutes today, I would go into specifics about your industry. But the fact of the matter is, across all industries across the world, the defection rate in the first year is somewhere between 15 and 50%. What's really interesting is that the defection rate is most pronounced in the first 100 days. And what the science has shown is that in that first 100 days, that's when customers have, are making their opinion of you. That's when they're deciding if you're actually gonna deliver on what you promise. This is that time when the buyer's remorse is most active in their mind, and what you're doing during that 100-day cycle to counter that makes all the difference in whether you succeed or fail. Now, the kicker is your business operations actually make it worse, okay? Think of this like in your personal life. Uh, you're treating your prospects like you might someone that you meet and go on a date with, right? You meet, maybe you go to dinner, you have some good times, you learn a little bit about them, they learn about you, one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and finally you're like, you know what, finally I'm ready to commit. I'm ready to go all in. And so you have a big celebration. You know, we might call this a wedding, we might call it a contract signing, we might call it a kickoff meeting and you grab your customer's hand, and you walk in and you say, this is absolutely fantastic. You open the door to the honeymoon suite that is your relationship going forward, and you say, guess what? I'd like to introduce you to Bob. Bob's gonna be your account rep going forward. He's gonna take care of you. I need to go find some new customers. Is it any wonder that people are leaving our businesses when we're asking them to sleep with Bob, who they've never met? The good news is there's actually a solution to this problem, all right? And the solution lies in the customer life cycle. Now what's important is, right now everybody spends a lot of time focused on the left side of the life cycle. How do I increase brand awareness? How do I get more people to do business with me? What do I do to generate leads? How do I find prospects? When in reality we should be spending our time over here, just after the buy decision. At that point where we're saying, how can I make you feel welcome? How can I make you feel engaged? How can I counter the buyer's remorse that you are psychologically programmed to feel in a way that is gonna change our relationship going forward. It all happens in the first 100 days. And if you can get the first 100 days right, the fact of the matter is you can have a customer for life. So in the first 100 days, there are six main ways you might interact with people. Personal, via email, some of you might actually send mail, a few of you get on the phone with them. The really forward-thinking folks do a video, and the folks that are just knocking the doors off and really best in class build in presents and bonuses and unexpected little moments to astonish their customers. What's fascinating is if we can reduce the defection rate by 5%, Across businesses in all industries, it will increase your profits by 25 to 100%. How many of you would like to have a 100% increase in profits this year? Heck, how many would like to have a 25% increase in profits? All you need is some effort, some plan, okay? What you really need is a first 100 days strategy. And the first 100 days strategy is broken into three parts. The first being investigate. Now when it comes time to investigating, let's pretend for sake of our conversation that all the people in this room, you're my customers. And I'm gonna try to connect with you in the first 100 days. And so hopefully I at least have your last names, all right? And what I might be able to do when I look at your last names is I might be able to say, well, wait, wait a second. Some of you might know each other. Some of you might be related. Some of you might be married. Be careful, don't just presume that the last name means there's a connection with the other person but it can provide some insight. Well, then what about their first names? So we look at their first name and we might say, all right, well, how can we connect with them? Do you know they've done studies around the world across all languages and all cultures? The most pleasing sound to the human ear is the sound of your own voice. The most pleasing sound is the sound of your own name. Excuse me, it's the sound of your own name, all right? The sound of your own voice. Some of you were nodding vigorously at that point. You're like, yes, I love to talk to myself. All right, the sound of your own name, right? And some of you may say, but Joey, I have all my customers' names, and we do a nice mail merge right into it so that the email says, Dear Lewis, you know, or Dear Mark, whatever it may be. And okay, guess what? That's great. But my gut instinct is in your own internal systems, you actually record them by a number, customer number. Are you really treating them personally? 
Or is that just the window dressing to try to create a sense of connection? What if we spent a few minutes on Facebook and LinkedIn, and we tried to posit the question, can the proverbial picture tell a thousand words? What could we learn from profile pics? Well, we could learn up here that AJ likes to work out. We could learn that Bruce likes to run with the bulls. Chris, I mean, he's just a wild and crazy guy. There's no way about it. George, he likes to sleep. Dr. J, that guy lives to smile, all right? Um, you know, we could learn things like Jim over here likes to be kissed. I mean, who doesn't at the end of the day, right? Justin likes watches. Uh, Mark down here, he's a big, deep thinker. Uh, Nisha in the bottom row here, she's a more pensive, angelic thinker. We'd learn that Susan loves dogs, Sid loves boxing, and Tomas, he loves cartoons. And let's not forget Jason, our fearless leader, right? When you look at that picture, can you not tell that this man loves life, that he's the embodiment of happiness and joy? <laughs> it's as simple as looking at the photos. What if we figured out where people were, and we took the time to actually look at that, and we said, are they working their life's mission and their life's passion? Or are they just doing a J-O-B to earn a paycheck and look for the next thing? What if we looked at where they went to college or university? You know, what's fascinating is not only could we learn who they root for on the weekends in the big game, but we might actually learn where their beliefs are based, where their values are, the intro knowledge that they have when they come to meet us for the first time. We might learn who they really care about, a significant other, a partner, a spouse. We can learn if they're focused on the future, about building a legacy, looking out for the little people that they've brought into this world. We can learn if they love animals. Maybe they love dogs. Maybe they love cats. If they're like Ryan, they love kangaroos. I like it. I like it. We might learn that there's a certain place that they go where the world slips away, and they're truly themselves. We might learn that they like to lean into life. They like to choose their own adventure. And the point isn't what you learn, it's that you learn. It's that you investigate in a way that you actually find some bonds that you can make with your customers. Because this investigation leads us to the second part, which is personalization. How do we actually use the information we've obtained to personalize the relationship in the first 100 days? We might learn that six of our customers went to law school, but don't practice law anymore. I bet there's some interesting stories there. We might learn that Yannick loves colorful socks. We might learn that Diana and Jeff make colorful socks. Do you think the way to their heart might be through their feet? We could learn that Samantha loves the color pink, pink gum, pink highlighters, pink nails, pink glasses, and that Isaiah loves artwork with just a dash of pink. Is pink the promotion that will persuade them? We might learn that Chandra studied space exploration, and Sherry always imagined herself as an astronaut. Can we show them a new frontier? We might learn that Alex is all about hair extensions. And ironically enough, so is Sophie, as long as they're feathers. Is this proof of the proverbial adage that birds of a feather flock together? Well, at least in our customer base, they do. Finally, we might see that Yannick loves to dress up like a zombie, and Geb sells t-shirts that have zombies on them. If we started treating our customers this way, if we started personalizing our interactions, would it be safe to say that they would stop thinking of us as a cold, lifeless, undead organization and actually believe us when we say we care about our customers? Finally, our third step is we need to surprise, right? We need to do something different. Statistically, of these six options you have for interacting with your customers in the first 100 days, the majority of you are doing two, maybe three. How would it surprise them if you did all six? How would it surprise them if you got a new customer and you sent them a personalized video like Jason did? It would change their experience. They'd tell their friends about it. You'd become remarkable. What if we actually got Bob involved in the conversation earlier? If you have account reps, that's fine. Let's invite him to the meeting with the prospect. Let's let them start to interact with prospects before they become customers. Build the relationship before the job is the relationship. What would happen if we built in presence, bonuses, opportunities to astonish 
and amaze our customers. And we built these in from the outset, not just as an afterthought when we you know, kind of were like, oh, maybe I should do something special for them because I screwed up this other thing. But we actually built in moments of delight from the beginning. You should be doing two to three of these in the first 100 days. If you do, you will have raving fans. It's that simple, the science proves it. Your first 100 days solution is at your fingertips. And my hope in today's presentation, while only a few minutes long, was that I've gotten you to feel a little bit differently about your customers. That I've gotten you to think a little bit differently about how you operate your business. And where the real rubber meets the road is have I made sure that you've actually acted? So when you go back to your office on Monday, what are you gonna do to implement a first 100 days plan into your business? Because the fact of the matter is, your business is gonna be a roller coaster. Your customers are gonna experience that, and at times their face is gonna look like this. But my hope is after our brief time today that you'll actually be able to lend them a helping hand, to serve as a guide as they try to navigate doing business with you. At the end of the day, if you get the first 100 days right, you can have a customer for life. And going forward, I wish you the very best with those first 100 days. Oh!